All right. Well, why don't we why don't we start? I think I think the the sooner we we launch in, we'll get more, the sooner we'll get into some really interesting conversations. And I'll I'll start by introducing Jared, who it seems like most people already know, but I'll I'll just say anyway, this is a conversation I've been really looking forward to having for a long time. And I think finally a month or so ago, I I just reached out to Jared and said, hey, we gotta we gotta do this, and and we did. So Jared, of course, is a pioneer in the medium of digital theater, which of course makes speaks to something that's very close to my heart. He's a, an OB winning theater uh, artist of all kinds, director, multimedia designer. He's a playwright. He's a performer. He's, he basically does everything and he does it very well. <laughs> and his work has been at the Kennedy Center, at the Geffen Stay House and Playhouse, uh, Wooly, and a bunch of other places. Uh, he founded the Virtual Design Collective during the pandemic, which has been um, responsible for about 50, is it? Or probably more by now? Well, well more. That's, yeah. that's about a year ago. So yeah. yeah digital works uh, since then. And he is finishing a book. I think we'll just kind of, maybe we can just talk about that later. A Multimedia Designer's uh, Method to Theatrical Storytelling. Is that the title? Yeah. All yeah. right. Excellent. And we'll talk, we'll talk more about that. Those are the things that he is done. But uh, for a guy that I think for this audience needs very little introduction, I'd still like to introduce Jared Mazzacci. Jared, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, it's awesome to be here. And uh, it's cool. When I got the list of names of people who are going to be here, I was like, all right, this is like a Family dinner. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> and what I like to do is very briefly allow people to say who they are and what brings them to the conversation. I'm Jim McCarthy. Uh, many of you know me, um, but I'm the the co-founder and CEO of Stellar, uh, formerly the CEO of Gold Star, and I was the founder of Gold Star, co-creator of TEDx Broadway. Uh, gosh, I've I've uh, sold a lot of tickets to theater and performing arts and other things in my life over the years. And obviously during the pandemic, became, this became um, uh, digital theater and virtual events as a whole became a, an important part of, of my life. And I've been spending the last few years really giving a lot of thought to how we optimize it for the field and how we optimize it for the world. And so that brings us to here. Um, and we'll talk more about all that stuff later, but I would love to get a short, uh, cue from each of you about what brings you here and who you are. And uh, we can start in sort of any order at all. Um, why don't we start with Allison, who's closest to my block on the on the screen. Um, hi, yeah, my name's Allison. Uh, I write plays, um, although sometimes I think I, I end up doing more than that, I guess. It becomes kind of all-encompassing at times. Um, I'm just here because I saw Jared post about it, and um, I like how Jared kind of keeps this conversation going um, in the public about digital theater. So I was really interested to just support him and, and hear, you know, be part of the conversation, hear what he had to say. Awesome. Thank you, Allison. Steven? Hi, uh, Steven. Uh, playwright, performer-ish. <laughs> um, and... Um, very much, uh, you know, uh, was grounded in the uh, traditional paradigms when the 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 earth shifted out from under me, and uh, you know, trying to shift with it, and uh, uh, the the work uh, I've seen Jared do has been phenomenal. Uh, like uh, I, I caught uh, your show over at uh, uh, here, which was you know uh, stunning just to watch it uh, happen in real time with you know the, the the editing panel and everything. And it's like this is such a cool thing that can happen that um, you know it you know digital theater can be so much more than just taking a script that had been written for the stage and moving it onto Zoom that, um, you know, I have to readjust my thinking quite a bit. And I think that's uh, something uh, I <laughs> want to help with. So I thought uh, probably worth attending. Awesome. Thank you, Stephen. Louisa, how you doing? Hello, happy new year. Happy new year. We to can you still too. say that in late January. I think January. it's okay for, for maybe another week ish. 
Um, hi, I'm Louisa. I am an actor, writer, musician, and I am the creator of Filmed Live Musicals, which is a website dedicated to cataloging stage musicals that have been legally filmed and made available to the public. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, J uh, Jonathan. Hi, <clears throat> I'm a journalist and a theater critic. I was astonished by all the theater being made during the pandemic um, shutdown and wrote a lot about it and more astonished by the resistance to it <laughs> by fellow critics and other theater artists. Uh, well, I suspected that uh, astonishment and resistance might be topics of conversation that we get into here a little bit, but uh, thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and then others of you who are, if you're if you're on and you're not, for whatever reason, joining us on video, that, that's fine. But if you do jump in, feel free to, to introduce yourself when you do. Um, don't want to put any pressure on people, and there may be others that come in too. So I think we should just jump in here. Let, and I actually think Jonathan teased this up very well for us. Um, and I'll, oh, by the way, last thing, I want to encourage people to not see this as a, a dialogue or a conversation between me and Jared, but do, you know, find the right moment to just, just kind of jump in. Uh, <laughs> oh, Emma, Emma wants it. Okay, Emma, by all means, with or without the camera, feel free to introduce yourself. Hi, yes, um, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, my name is Emma Bilderback. I am a dramaturg. Uh, I am one of the members of the Literary Managers and Dramaturgs of the America. I am one of their co-vice presidents of anti-oppression. Uh, I found out about this event because uh, Jared and I are Twitter mutuals, um, <laughs> which is cool and fun. Um, I'm also the digital conference coordinator for LMDA's annual conference, which we will be hosting um, at the very beginning of February. So I'm very much um, this is in between meetings for that. So Got it. that's where we're Excellent. at. With it. Excellent. So Very thanks. good. Thanks so much. All nice right. to hear a voice with your Twitter feed, Emma. <laughs> yeah, good, to, good to put a voice to the Twitter. To the at tweet. least one oh, step. Yeah. At least one step. <laughs> All right. Um, so let, I think we should just jump right into the question of where where are we now? So uh, obviously, I think for those of us who've been part of the digital theater and just digital live events thing for the last few years, I feel like every three months has been a new phase, you know, from the the days in the very beginning of the pandemic where people were just desperate to put anything on its feet and you had, you know, famous musicians doing concerts from their sofa in their pajamas, that phase ended and we got into some pretty, pretty good productions that um, were really, you know, had budgets and were and had audiences and things like that. And some even more sophisticated ones, um, you know, in the music space, which I know that most of the people here are in the theater space, but we went through a phase in early 21 where uh, where artists, music artists were getting and in many cases rejecting extremely aggressive nonsensical offers to perform concerts to virtual audiences and then mm. th that bubble sort of rose and fell all in the space of about three months and so we moved out of that phase, and then we got into the phase where uh, people were returning to the in-person venue and it really sort of shook people up. And and so I think we finally reached a point now where you might say we're maybe at a stable point or, you know, not that it's a, a great stable point, but I, I, I don't know. That's how I feel. I feel like we're, we're at a place now we sort of know where we are. Um, Jared, do you I guess, do you agree with that? And how would you describe that current state? <laughs> yeah, I actually, um, I am relieved that in-person theater is back. Uh, yeah. because I feel like the comparator was ill, uh, yeah, ill advised in a lot of ways. There, I think the comparator of of uh, what is better uh, will kill both, and yeah. um, and actually, it is about extending the net. It's about widening the net, and so I'm actually quite relieved to let the critics of traditional theater making kind of return to what they feel comfortable with because now is now the tools the the door has been opened and so uh and and quite frankly the 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 pandemic in terms of an artistic fervor uh was a like what about what about what about what about which which exploded the options in a really exciting way um but i feel like the the critical resistance to it um, was because we married it to a to a pandemic, and and it it was happening long before the pandemic. This yeah. the, so so there's there's kind of a relief 
of now we are back at a tabula rasa where the people who are looking at it are the people who actually are intrigued by it as opposed to being forced to have to adapt their job in a way that they did not want. the resistance to it was i think a resistance to the fact that they didn't want to be doing that and right. i don't i don't want people responding to my work who don't want to be there you know there there, there was um, a lot of half baked stuff that i think came out of a sense of of having to do it I think. yeah and I, I also think that there was a I kept asking the question on Twitter, are we critiquing the product or are we critiquing the option, like the, the mm -hmm. buffet? Because if we're just critiquing the product, we're all screwed because we don't know what the thing is yet, you right. know? And, and so like, can we, can we all accept that this will be an imperfect time period? And in doing so, can we celebrate the tools that are kind of erupting in this moment. And I, I had a back and forth with a couple of critics on Twitter where I was like, when you're critiquing this thing, can you also just put it into context of, uh, you know, Section 230, the thing that that Stephen, um, that, that many of you saw, yeah. but Stephen spoke to, I, I think it's, it's really imperfect. Like, I, I don't think the thing is anywhere near where it could be, but the act of here are its, commissioning me to make a thing in a very quick period of time. The thing I wanted to experiment with on that show was how can I help the audience see the liveness and the generative nature of the thing by showing me and the two raw actor feeds and the product, which is like Wooster Group, which is like Builders Association, Big Art Group, all these groups that have the wires in front of the stage and ask the audience to look over that at the product so that they can see the making of to me, that was like a raging success in terms of my portfolio question. Like I answered every question I needed to answer on that. But the, the conversation I had with the critic on, on Twitter was like, oh, so you're asking me to forgive the imperfections at well, the expense of the making. And I was like, no, that's not, I can I, still be critical, you know. I mean, but, I mean, you could say the same thing about like pretending that two chairs are a car on a Broadway stage, which happens every night, right? Right. Like, right that's just the one that more people are used to doing. And totally. And I think that the, to, to that end, I think that the problem is, is that we are being asked to view the work through a new lens, which is a lens yeah. that is used with Spielberg or mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. Hamilton on Disney plus, which did not serve this cause. It served a great cause, but it did yeah. not serve this cause. Cause I'm having meetings with artistic directors in New York where they're like, we want to do digital, but it costs like $900,000 to do. Right. Cause right. Hamilton, and I was like, no, talk to Hear Arts. It's not that. Yeah. Um, and and so to try and uh, deconstruct the the value system, I talked to Kui Wen, who wrote um, She Kills Monsters, Viet Gone. He's a good friend of mine. And he works in Marvel right now, too. Mm -hmm. And he, he said that point, um, Jim, about... Uh, he was like, you know, when Superman needs to fly in Marvel, it's hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. And lo and behold, Superman flies. Right. Superman on stage flying is a couple of shoelaces, a chair and a sheet. And lo and behold, Superman still flies. Still flies. But, but we have taught the audience different lenses. And this one confuses the two lenses, which is exciting to me. That's like, I mean, it, you know, I, I think it's best seen as a different medium, right? I, I'm sure right. you'd agree with that. Like there, there's certainly things that resemble let's say film or however you want to characterize that medium. And there's certainly things that resemble theater the way that, that you'd conventionally see it, but the possibilities artistically and, and even commercially in every other way are just are new, like they're just, very just new, a yeah. new set of dimensions. And I think that, and this is the thing to what Emma's talking about with Twitter, which I'm psyched that Emma's here as a dramaturg is um, to, to be very clear about the value systems that you're bringing to the table on your experiment. And I say experiment intentionally because I, I hate the word product or production right now because I can say experiment and you can say, oh, cool. I wonder if it'll work. And that's exciting as opposed to production. I hope it's good, you know? Yeah. Um, and so what's that? Show. Or a show, yeah. I, I, I just in in interviews and stuff. I, I trained myself to say this exper. What I did here as an experiment was, you know, but it is a show. I also don't want to for <laughs> avoid that term. But I think that um, for me, when I started in the pandemic, I said uh, I'm a theater artist that's working with cinematic tools. So as a result of that, liveness is important, imagination is important, the uncanny valley is important, and co-presence is important. I yeah. want to make sure that everything I'm doing, whether it's successful or failure, 
is is investigating what does it mean to have liveness and co-presence what does it mean for an audience to feel the thing happening in real yeah. time and what is the thing uh what are our limitations by saying it must be live and um for better or worse that has been kind of my guiding force for everything i've done leading to section 230 at here arts which was really trying to uh, we put the audience on stage as well and an audience watching from a stream so you could really feel the sense of co-presence even if you weren't even if you chose um as emma is right now uh, of video off the witnessing of co-presence is i think just as powerful as participating you, i i gotta tell you i i have this discussion with people all the time in the context of when talking to them about using stellar or potentially using stellar and this is sort of jonathan's point earlier about the, the resistance of the sort of, I, I don't know, hesitance. I, I find that I am constantly having to stand up for A, just doing it in real time, uh, and B, m trying to make the point, which I guess is a little bit of a philosophical point, but I think it's very straightforward, that the you know witnessing the fact that other people are there, that there's some impact of the audience on the on the feeling is so important. It's important to in so yeah. many different ways, you know, um, but I but I find myself kind of having to make the uh, the unpopular argument in favor of that very often when I'm when I'm trying because people are trying to sort of roll back to when I I just film something and then make it available. I'm like, it's not the same, you know. It's it, it's something, but it's not yeah. the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jonathan, ahead, Jonathan, yeah. Make a comment hmm. and ask a question. The comment is, I just did an article for HowlRound, which may not see the light for a while, but I interviewed a bunch of uh, theater artists who were trying to continue this work past the pandemic shutdown. And one of the things a couple of them pointed out about their colleagues who aren't trying to continue is much more compassion and sympathy and understanding than I had before to the resistors and the basic th thing was they're just overwhelmed things have not returned to normal the pandemic's still threatening them in terms of their health and life and financially they just don't have the bandwidth right now to to launch into this new thing yeah. which didn't quite work for them um so i'm not sure I'm, you know i'm on your side but i'm not sure that yeah, it's the resistors are, you know, don't want to do it. It's that they have too much going yeah. on to I, even think about it. That that's yeah. definitely been my take on it. On this is that, you know, it it will be a while before the sort of core mainstream of this world is ready. But um, I, I also who are yeah the the opportunities there. I also think. Um, there's a dismantling of a one-to-one -one thing that needs to happen too. Like to do a digital work during the pandemic meant a full two and a half hour show, you know, like a, a, a basically like a, a replication of a thing that we know to be in person. And I think the joy of uh, when I did um, what if, if only with, with less waters, um, the a new Carol Churchill piece, it's five pages long. It was a 12 minute piece that we did um through natco and then here arts it was like 32 minutes long and it was a great joy to be released from time code being a part of the identity of the thing and i think it it like loosened up the resource suck of what we are what we experienced during the pandemic um as one thing and that was something this artistic director i met in new york last week kind of like loosening up um what these pieces could be and serve they could be quite they could be quite short it could be you know pixar did it very well with their shows before the movie you know it's like these like beautiful short films yeah. that kind of like like exploded the short film circuit in a lot of ways and that's it's a cool way to kind of team up with with like a short a shorthanded thing i would also say jonathan um geffen when they did the stay house series which was seven shows it was um directly related to them not wanting to lay anybody off or put anybody on furlough and so it, they basically said you're a props designer you're going to be in charge of the box we send to everybody you're a production manager we're going to need you to learn a couple of things but 
and and they very clearly at the end of it said look after someone else's house is done as the seventh show we're not going to try and straddle the two we are absolutely bringing everyone back into the role that they served as in-person theater and i think there was a great appreciation um from from the staff to know that because there's other theaters who are like that kind of worked maybe we should continue and now you have a production manager who's also a line editor of a like you're you're double dipping the the people because the yeah. theater the theater just can't hire two teams and digital is not in a marketplace right now that can afford the the financial risk we're still trying to build what the damn market is and who the audience is of that so the risk isn't isn't there so now you're having a production manager filling two roles being paid for one i get why people resist it at that point you know um so i think it's a bigger it's a bigger question and that's where with uh vidco with my company we're going to these theaters being like just commission us to do a small thing and we'll take care of the, the whole thing and we'll come in and kind of like offer it up and you can you can name it as uh, uh we can put our logos together and make the thing but it feels more like a touring circuit that comes through and isn't imposing on their season selection um and is kind of a way just to keep juicing the market to say it still exists it's kind of cool let's see what happens what, um, what i what i think um about that is that some percentage of the of the industry needs to be building their capabilities um, even if from a, a, a small level, right? There, there's no way to get to a place in five years where you have a, a, a wider range of capabilities or understanding of the market if you're not kind of going up that learning curve now. So that that's the place where I would have encu- I would encourage somebody who had some success at that time to at least be trying to put a, a floor underneath it, right? Trying to to kind of climb the ladder of understanding what they need to do. I and to the, yeah, I, I agree with that. And I also have seen a surge in um, people contacting me in the last month about new grant opportunities that they would like to talk about where there are grants now that are specifically targeting um, digital infrastructure. And um, that is thrilling because I think uh, what has been leading up to this point has been the theater needing to kind of reconfigure their already waning budget yeah, right. to figure that out. So it's it's great to hear that there's um, that grants are now starting to encourage the thing, which doesn't surprise me given the access and mission aspects of this and and sort of how this touches on that. But what, but while I've got, kind of got a moment here, um, anybody I'd just like to welcome anybody to jump in. So that, you know on that point, or if you'd like to shift the conversation in a slightly different direction. Anyone who has well, not I had the question. You're okay. Right. Oh, you didn't ask the question by, by all means. Yes. <laughs> uh, I guess um, I, I read your book beyond the back row mm. and I've talked to Jared a few times and, and both of you may, seem to make an assumption that digital theater, which has like four other names, virtual live streaming. Sure. Uh, online means live. So I guess the question is, am I right in perceiving that that's how you see it and that recordings made uh, of live productions, but then recordings made and then shown on demand is not the same thing? Or what what constitutes yeah. the universe of digital theater? Yeah, um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, the the what you perceive as my assumption is actually just my m- mantra, like my, my take on what I'm interested in in this larger pie. Um, I, I'm interested. I think the most important thing is that we are establishing language that identifies that a live stream and an on demand archive of a thing or a digitally native thing is a building blocks of vocabulary, much like in the round proscenium thrust stages, right? Like to me, I think that uh, the digital marketplace should embody all of those things, but we should not call them the same thing. Sure, we could call it all digital theater, but within that, this is where the Here Arts portal got really exciting to me because they have different options of like, you could see the live stream, you could see an archive of the live thing, or you could see a film that we just made on this thing. And that to me is really, um, I guess that's that's the, the hopeful thing. When we start to establish a word bank, 
I think that's part of the foundation builds of of people knowing so that they're not accidentally going to see Hamilton on Disney Plus when they thought they were going to go see a different type of digital thing that that like Blockbuster has their different genres when you're going to get different movies and you have staff picks over here and you that like you kind of understand that you're going to go to this aisle because this is the type of thing that you're interested in that to me I think is it, that to me is very thrilling. So, it, it, and also to fight against the critical, the critics and the resistance of is it theater, isn't it theater? I would hope that this community isn't doing the same to itself, but is instead saying, oh, yes, and yes, and yeah, oh, that's interesting. I hadn't even thought about AR or VR. I hadn't even thought about, and, and once we build that word bank out, perhaps perhaps later on down the road, I would want, I would want personally to investigate what the thread and the theme, the like consistent thing amidst them all is, which might not be live, but there's something about it that makes it to me when I watch this stuff inherently not film, but something else. And I don't know, but now I'm doing the same thing to film to say this isn't film. So I don't know. So I'm, my answer to that is that it's not that I don't believe that those things are valuable or belong in the same category. Like Jared saying, like I absolutely add it, right? Yes, and to all that stuff. I just have found that the, the very best, most interesting things that I've seen over the last few years have been, happen to have been live. Because again, the presence of the audience, the presence of, you know, some something that reminds you that this is happening in real time adds to it. Um, but I wouldn't by any means exclude it. Luisa, I'm curious, I, I want to get you in on this because obviously filmed live musicals is right in the name of, of the thing that you do. So what do you, what, what do you have to add to that part of the discussion? This is one of my favorite obsessions is like, <laughs> what do we call it? Yeah. <laughs> um, and how do we help people understand what it is? Because like I've spoken to industry people, like profession, theater professionals who don't understand the difference between Hamilton filmed live and um, singing in the rain. Like they don't understand that the difference between something filmed in a theater versus a, like um, made on a soundstage. And um, the idea of liveness is also so complicated because like the everyone in the industry is using the same terms for different things. Like, so you, there's so many captures that like filmed, uh, filmed live, coming to you live from, especially live from Broadway, and it's actually been filmed five years ago and it has been sitting in an archive. So it's really- But, but like, it was live at the time, so it's live, it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, okay. but it's so, but like, how do we, like, yeah. is a live stream like meant to be happening at this moment or is it just right. a record? Like, it's so complicated and the industry can't agree on what it is, let yeah. alone like, how do we help the audience understand what they're consuming? Steven, looks like you're looking to get in there. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, I, I have I have thoughts. They are, you know, developing since I am, you know, a neophyte to all this. But I think uh, I think uh, the key to the differentiation in all of this, to me at least, is the audience intent. Um, yeah. I think um, you know, with uh, Section three hundred and twenty, with all the different options, I think everyone going into it, um, you know, the intent was to see the same event, um, you know, not necessarily at the same time if you pick different options, um, but, you know, the audience is still going in with the intent to see this one particular thing. Um, and uh, with a, uh, with a filmed, uh stage show i think you know unless you have a, a social media darling like lin manuel miranda live tweeting <laughs> through the whole thing that's you know something where the the audience isn't necessarily going to be on the same page at the same time with the same intent um and then you know you have the uh do whatever whenever kind of 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 regular film or tv uh, you talk about so, watch parties right like when they have watch parties they all watch it the yes same exactly time. you know it's um, previously recorded yes it's live and, in the sense of an audience 
Uh, there's yeah. an aspect of it that is live. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and that, that uh, actually is, adds adds a dimension. I, I've found you know that that brings a, an excitement level that's that's different. Yes, from absolutely. Watching. It makes it makes the experience more communal, which I think is you know the lifeblood of the theatrical audience experience. Uh -huh. um, and um, uh, I'm sorry, I feel like I am condescending to the uh, the uh, filmed stage experience which is not my intent at all because um you know i'm i'm high risk for covid i'm homebound that's how i see the vast majority of things um and you know if i could get a genie's lamp the main thing i would do is uh make a uh, toft uh reach some kind of streaming deal um <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, uh, I would also i would also say to that um to, to this notion i think there is um this is this is undercooked this thought but the idea of like locating time space liveness of a thing is a part of the identification of what it is and like uh, to me, I think something that I, I kind of stumbled upon in um, a hell around essay I, I wrote right in the peak of the pandemic was actually like, where's the editor in the process? And how can that help us understand uh, the, the notion of liveness? It doesn't mean that there's a cliff in which it's like, ah, it's no longer theater, but, but like asking the question of where the editor is because when it's in person on stage there's no editor anything can happen and that to the audience intent is like i want to be there i want to i want to see this thing happen and i think as we move into digital the proximity of the editor to the thing plays some a role in that and and perhaps to luis's genre of of uh uh the of like a, a filmed edit I, i've been an editor on stuff too and something that i do with bard at the gate is actually set up all my track it's pre bard at the gate with paula vogel is pre film we film it on zoom we take the green screen we put it into an edit we make a film but what i ask the directors to do is never stop a scene mid scene make the scene run through and what i will do is edit the thing in real time in a tv edit and then make some notes and then run it again and kind of re-edit it so that the the there's a, a kind of liveness to that and that there's a, to me there's a kind of kinetic nature to the scene where yeah and i'm not saying every it. yeah and i'm not saying everyone should do it that way but it's it's that intent of the editor to try and hold that kinetic energy somehow feels very thrilling to me. And I think that that led me to, after doing a full season of that, to how I built Section 230. It was like, oh, well, I wonder if we could do this in a, in a people could witness me in my office doing that, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, by the way, does anyone, Allison or Emma, you guys have been a little quiet. So if you do, by all means, jump in if you'd like to. Um, well, I actually, uh really relate to what you just said Jared because um I just made kind of like a it's very odd, hard to explain the digital thing I just made because it was written as an audio play um mm -hmm. and uh because it was part of the exponential festival they wanted like some kind of visual component because their digital venue is YouTube so um it was recorded in um like a sound space where I had a voice director who the actors would act out the scene um, kind of like what you're saying, Jared, they were full scenes acted through. There was no stopping. Um, and uh, then later there was editing with the sound and the video and such. But um, I really <laughs> want to connect that to um, what Stephen was saying, because I think a lot of how I think about digital is just the venue itself. Um, you know, going back to just audio itself as like a form of digital theater, the venue is your brain. Um, if you think of like your daydream or something is like the proscenium or like the YouTube page you're watching and the skin around it is like the thing surrounding the stage. It becomes kind of like its own version of a theater, especially for someone homebound. You know, for instance, my, my parents are disabled and they were able to see the play and they watched it multiple times. And um, I mean, there's something I think about liveness there too, because then it's like, oh, now you can repeat the thing versus 
a live thing that you can't repeat. Um, but I think it, it kind of is like a benefit to digital theater that makes it like a new theater. Um, I feel like I'm kind of ranting, but mm -hmm. I think I've learned a bit through this process, both also in talking to Jared, because I talked to him about it beforehand, because I was trying to figure out like how to make it more live. Um, and when it premiered, uh, we had like a the YouTube chat, because there's like, when something premieres live on YouTube for the very first time, there's a chat room. Um, and that's like the one time there's like a bit of a liveness to it. And um, I don't know, I, I'm really curious on this idea of like, how can like a venue not be static and like, it can still be someone's venue, even though it's not like you're sitting in a theater. Um, you I know, love that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I love, I love that. Um, I love that. And I, I also think there's something I was talking, um, I was talking to Jim before you guys all got on, but this idea of the can and cannot audiences and that like when the pandemic hit, everyone was a cannot and then the pandemic has loosened up and now the cannot, some cannots now are can go to or witness or, and we are kind of forgetting that actually even before the pandemic, there were cannots that were then welcomed into the invitation of coming to see work during this time and as we head back into what used to be the kind of strategies of theater goers um we have to confront this bigger question of the can how do we allow the cannots to be can still even well, even in this moment and well, and and that to me yeah. just to tie that up really quick is 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 a uh, what is live to me is in response to the things that i can do and so an audience member who is sitting at home, who is homebound and will remain homebound, their can and cannot spectrum is very different than my can and cannot spectrum. And, and how, how do we make sure our lens is still on that in a very thrilling way? Because a thing that is a can there is, a, is now a cannot here or vice versa. And so we have to remember that. I, th I think the other thing to... a little. I kind of lost you on can and cannot. Well, sorry. So we were we were talking about the fact that during the pandemic, none of us was able to go to theater, right? So we were all cannots. Um, that changed when the in person came back. It opened up for some, but I, I think the point that I that I make all the time is that if you if you really think about who's a cannot for any given show, it's almost everybody, right? Like so, everybody who's not in New York is a cannot for Broadway tonight no matter their age, their health, their wealth, their anything else. And at the same time, the, the interest and the demand for those shows is a lot larger than the number of people who can be in the room. And so mm -hmm. I, for me, there, there, of course, there's that, that issue of serving people who are you know, sort of structurally denied you know, access to, to a theater for whatever reason. But there's also this issue of like, hey, most of us are denied the opportunity on any given thing. You know, the, one of the examples that I write about in my book is imagine the hypothetical greatest small theater in the world. You know what I mean? It's it's only a tiny number of people who are going to see that work in the best of cases. And yet, you know, all of us as theater fans and millions of others would probably like to to see that on any given night and have no opportunity to do so. So, and, re, you know, yeah. broadening the, the power of that can cannot metaphor, I think, is for me, one of the keys to the future here. And, and I think, too, sure, the, sure. I'm sorry. Well, just to add to that, too, I think one of the big things that I've realized as we we're getting back into this theater going space is that it's it is uh, it, it, and I see this in the chat. What is accessibility? It's broadening to me now because, you know, for those who saw uh, Indecent written by Paula Vogel down in Florida cannot right now. They got censored because of the new political yeah. um, agendas down there. And so now the conversation of like, oh, my God, that's a cannot. What can we do here to help that? And and so it's not just about physical disability. Uh, it's also political disability. It's also uh, uh, sexual sexual orientation disability. There's, there's all of these different things that. Uh, are a can and cannot that as we keep coming back into the world, I'm just broadening that spectrum of right. what this can be, how this can be serving, you know. Sorry, Do the both of you uh, feel that the ideal digital theater is a hybrid, that it's first done on stage and then done on screen? I, I used to. Um, and then uh, uh, I met 
I, I had a long conversation with Mika Jennings, who was the performer in Section 230, who Jonathan, um, you, you were aware, passed away right after we closed that show. And uh, it rocked me. And the conversation during that week was how much he was able to be himself again by sitting at the kitchen table and being able to perform that show in real time with all of the skills that he knew were still in him, but based on the structure of theater going and in-person venue centric making, he had been told for years he could not do anymore. He's one of the most prolific actors I've ever worked with. I toured with him on Big Art Group and it was exciting to bring him into section 230. That that week uh, we closed um, and after the show we stayed on Zoom and he said, what's the next step? And I said, well, I'm... I'm a hybrid maker. I'm excited to now take this and bring it into an in-person setting, but maybe it's cameras on stage and you can see the thing and the audience can join in and a digital audience can still be there. And I was thinking solely about the hybridity of audience. We could do an in-person audience with a streaming audience. That's exciting. And I completely failed to think about, and he quickly snapped it into the judgment of saying, I can't do that then you're now eliminating me from being able to do this. And we had this long conversation where he was like, this world can be enough if you allow it that space. And it can be for the performer and for the audience, a place of connectivity between those two groups of people who might, whether it's a choice or, or, uh, or kind of a forced decision to not be able to be in a venue. And it, it, that night it just rocked me. And, um, and then the next day I got this just horrific news that he didn't wait. He had open heart surgery. He was ailing in many ways, um, uh, past. And that's where these, the, this kind of conversation has sat with me to say, well, for, for that, I had never thought about the performer, aspect of this i had always been thinking about accessibility for audience and um he was a stark reminder of that so i think there's opportunity for hybrid but i don't think that that's the absolute end game of what this could be uh i, I don't you know I, I that that is an open can of worms it's exciting to me to think about you know uh, my answer to that is is basically the same in in, in the book I, there's a chapter about online only events versus hybrid events, and then some distinctions on hybrid events, because I think both they're gonna be respondent to the, the opportunity and, and the work and the piece and that kind of thing. So I definitely think there's a world where you just deliver an online event. Um, I, you know, yeah. Some kind of studio like setting or something like that. But I also think hybrid is very exciting in a lot of ways. And hybrid that's, hybrid that's events that are gonna happen anyway, and hybrid that are events where you kind of like bringing in an audience, almost like a late night talk show, right? Where the audience is there, but the main target of that audience is elsewhere, right? So there's there's multiple flavors of it. And I think this adds to that spectrum. I, I would also, I am excited for the day where we um, eliminate the term multi-hyphenate artist and hybrid making to like, I want to, I to back to the words, I, I want to like to say hybrid or to say, and this isn't to to um, slap at any risks of us to saying the word hybrid here. It's just that we, is the we term use what we're using got at the moment. Yeah, right? yeah. but uh, but I think the moment that we can identify it, this, yeah. we were talking about websites earlier. I used to call myself a multi hyphenate artist, and then the pandemic, I was like, no, I'm not. I just this is what I do, and like, how can I name this thing? Is because by naming it a multi hyphenate, you are inherently compromising yourself as a total work of art or a total artist. And I think the same thing with the hybrid, I think that's a helpful tool of the, the identifying that it's somewhere between film and theater, but so is TV and we call it TV. And so, Absolutely. you know, so I'm excited for that continued conversation around vocabulary, even though I think some people are like, dude, drop it on Twitter. I'm like, no, vocab, words mean so much. Language is everything. And um, and and not for us. I think language means everything for the new generation coming up saying, oh, it's, no, this has been a thing for hundreds of years, you know, yeah. because we've named the thing. So. It really yeah, and is. And as and dramaturgs, is... we're really concerned with language too. Like we talk about these existential things in our spaces, um, in the dramaturg spaces all the time. It's like, what are <laughs> we creating and who is it for? And, you know, how can we get it to as many people as possible? Because that's ultimately what all of us want, right? We want as many people to see the things that we make as possible. And the digital space 
is as of right now sort of the wild west the vast frontier of performance spaces um as we're talking uh i'm thinking i keep thinking about circle jerk which i don't know if any of you experienced Mm -hmm. um last year which was a which was a finalist for the pulitzer like it's so it was so incredible and it started as pure digital theater, like with no live audience, the audience was completely virtual, but they were able, it's the most, um, oh my gosh, it's like the most, it's the closest thing to theater of cruelty I think I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, They really get it. Um, And they, and it was really captured a zeitgeist moment. And I think that one thing that digital theater needs to do that I think, in order to sort of widen its widen its bases, it needs to be native to the digital space in a way that I think we're sort of transplanting live theater into digital spaces, sort of grafting it on um, and being like, look, here's here is a Frankenstein version of the thing we love, yeah. um, as opposed to, you know, creating something that is born and native to the digital world. And I think that in order to sort of understand how we move forward with these hybrid things, I think we have to figure out what the digital really, really is. Totally, Emma. Circle Jerk was also made into a stage play. Did you know that? Yes, after the fact. Yes, after the fact. Yeah, when when live, and I saw that version also, uh, that when it was went into, uh, had a live space, but it was virtually, the same it was yeah, largely identical so, but my that was actually on stellar the the hybrid not to use sure the, the jared doesn't like was was actually on stellar so they, there was an audience watching on stellar while they were watching in the venue and at the time i said these guys are writing to that future where the lines have been blurred and they don't need to have those yeah. distinctions like they they are they are among those who are already in the space that you're describing jared where yeah like whatever you know it's, it, it reminds me like in the late 80s when you started to have rock and roll artists having rap incorporated into their songs. And people were saying, is it rap? Is it rock? And I remember thinking, you know, as a 20 year old, like, I don't care, you know, it's cool. And I like it. Right. Like it was obvious to me. It was obvious to the beastie boys. It was obvious to whoever that like these things just go together. Right. So I felt very much that the, that circle jerk was an example of somebody who's already in that, in that future where these things just blend. Totally. And I think to that end, it's it's less a question of are people out there making it? The answer is absolutely yes. I think the question is, uh, where are we seeking opportunity to be making the to continue the work, too? And I think, like, is it um, I'm 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 spinning a little bit with what Emma, what you just said of the digitally native aspect of this. I think that's why I loved the 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 artistic fervor that took place during the pandemic yeah. so we had no other option we had to make digitally native things in that moment and um and people did and so now that we are we are venturing back out into the world the question of opportunity and where who's commissioning this work who's helping make this work who's lifting this work up fake friends uh, you know jeremy o'hara saw a great opportunity there to help support incredible voices in that time that's awesome so how else are we going to hear arts is now doing that with the you are here portal these grants are oper- are, are creating that but we are we are very um myself included very uh kind of like narrow minded of where these opportunities could be i i'm i'm interested in going to talk to nih i'm i'm interested to go talk to um other completely non artistic ventures to say look this is actually a huge tool for connectivity and storytelling sure. can we go to the hospitals can we go to the um so that we can continue to seek out innovative opportunity for the innovative work you know it's so what? interesting that you are talking about space because I've been like looking so deeply into, I want to use Twitch as a theater platform because it's already sort of has those live tools present. It's already understood as a platform for things to be happening live. There was a woman, I think during the pandemic, I think it might've been 2020, who did Chekhov's The Seagull with The Sims <laughs> on Twitch. And I thought it was like the most genius idea and it's like we that like and I talked about sort of grafting before and I think that that was one where it really really works but it's like there you're so right that there are these we are we are drowning in possible venues we just yeah. need to like ha- harness them 
for sure. Well, I want to respect everybody's time. We're a little longer than we said we were going to be. Uh, that's a good sign, usually. Um, <laughs> but we just started. <laughs> I know. I don't think we did just start, doesn't it? Um, so I guess before we wrap up, if anybody who hasn't yet had, a, if there's anything you absolutely have to ask or say, now's the time. Now's the time to do that. And if not, Jared, I'll, I'll sort of give you the the final word of things that you want people to think about coming out of this conversation or whatever else. Um, but yeah, about, last chance. Well, you talked about sec section 230 as something in the past, but people can see it now, correct? Yeah, you can go on your here, uh, the portal to continue to see it. And um, as always, I, you know, I have, I have the someone else's house from Geffen. I have on the beauty of loss from Vineyard, any of my work, the joy of digital is that it is, uh, archived as intended yeah. as opposed to the the camera off the center of the one show that what you know so um uh by all means you know go see the you in the you are here portal or uh just uh, i told them earlier to plug my twitter uh or or email on the say. website but but you all <laughs> this is how we're all here right now so um but definitely just continue that um if if you are interested in watching any of that stuff just let me know i'll send you a link jaredmazachi.com and yeah, and uh, yeah yeah there you go all right well i think we'll we'll end there I, everybody i appreciate you joining us today i had a great time i hope you did too and um we'll um uh, we'll thank you louisa um we will do more of these and invite you to them as they come along i think it's a nice format because everybody gets to to participate and not just listen so thank you guys for being part of that all right so have a good cool. day everybody so long thank you all <laughs>